development in, in the internationalization uh, realm. So that's something I'm going to be talking about. So why machine translation, internationalization, and is there a faster way of saying it? IET. okay. And MT, addressing technical challenges and optimization for global supply chain. So why MT? I think by now I don't really need to pitch MT. Uh, we've had enough discussions in this conference and many other conferences. It saves money, it saves time, it helps your ROI. There is one little thing we never discussed. It actually aids your internationalization efforts. And how does it do it? Simple. It's automated. It is predictable. It is rigid. And by being so, it can actually help you with things that might slip through the cracks with a human process. So, um, what is problematic data? What is the pain usually? Excessive number of internal tax variables. Multiple UI references, and everybody in this room probably has dealt with UI reference issue at some point. How do we code them? How do we translate them, not translate them? Put them in this type of brackets, put them in the quotes, uh, and all sorts of things you have to do. Inconsistent use of punctuation. It can be inconsistent use of punctuation in the source, or it can also be that punctuation is completely different between the source and the target. And that again, I would also consider it an internationalization issue. Entities and all the beauty it brings with it, entities mismatch, entities that are one kind in the source, they are a completely different kind in the target. Uh, acronyms. Some target languages, you have to expand them. Some target languages, you have to preserve them. Some target languages, they are completely different acronyms. So that's another big channel of course. Capitalization requirements. That's my ultimate favorite. I, myself, coming from a Russian culture, you don't capitalize a thing there. You don't need to. So when you have to translate into Russian, usually our clients, like uh, Francis, who was just outside, I don't know where he is, at Adobe, they always, oh, what do we do? Uh, you have to, we capitalize everything in US English. How are we going to translate? Is your MT solution able to handle that? And the good news is, yes, MT can actually do it. So what are the typical challenges? Date and time, yes, for sure. Different representations. I don't know how many of you have posted something onto Japanese server and then never be or FTP server and then never being able to find what you posted because the year comes first and then goes the month and then goes the day. Uh, delimiter. <coughs> That's another one. You delimit with a comma, you don't delimit with at all. Sometimes you use uh, points, so that's that's another problematic one. Encoding is another big issue. Punctuation, we already mentioned it. Variables, talking about PayPal content, if any content is super variable rich and causing major headaches, that's definitely content from the financial industry. It's all about variables. Entities and capitalization is bench. Yeah, that's another issue. Now to that, we also add a nice group of linguistic challenges. Style guide for UI, companies, tone of voice, do not translate references that are different for different locales. Relevant locale-specific translation choices, uh, metadata handling, a tag that can act as sentence breakers. So these are, apart from delivering good, linguistically smooth, clean translation, these are the issues that machine translation providers deal with. And these are uh, issues that content owners, clients deal with, and issues that we can help address. So MT Engine, in a nutshell, basically is equally responsible for internationalization and localization. Why? We translate the content. We take care of the linguistics. No questions there. But also, we translate date, time, addresses, punctuation, capitalization, and all the other locale conventions. So basically, if your MT Engine is doing a good job, you get two in one. If your MT Engine is not doing a good job, you miss two out of two. So good news. Look, date and time conversion, and uh, I'm using the Pro MT interface because that's pretty much the only interface I'm familiar with. It doesn't mean that we are the only MT engine out there doing it. Other MT engines, many MT engines are capable of doing the same MT thing for the interface. You know, that's something I have at hand when I need to take screenshots. So um, conversion algorithm. It's very simple, as you can see uh, right here, just by a couple of check marks. You can have your date and time conversion locale specific preferences selected for the entire volumes you're going to be translating. So that's a good thing. And as you can see, 
forever and ever, when you translate 9 p.m., you're going to get 21 for your European, uh, for your Europe-based content, if that's your selection. So date and time conversion, as you can see, your MT engine handles it easily. Now, the here specific punctuation conversion. That's another one, and I know that a lot of our clients struggle with punctuation, especially that quotation marks are a major headache for the clients when translating because my mother tongue, Russian, introduces those um, curly quotation marks. And then uh, even when in English there were either straight quotation marks or no quotation marks at all. Yet again, this is something that can easily be selected on the pre-processing level on the MT interface. As you can see, you have a set of options. Uh, convert, not convert, convert into what type, analyze, do not analyze, and so forth. So as you can see, here you have the proper quotation marks converted in all of your target language. So that's something your translators, or in this case already post editors, will not have to mess with. And if you don't post edit, you know that yes, you are observing the locale specific conventions. Um, UI elements. I'm sure my colleagues from um, Aquilinks also are having some uh, uh, their share of joy when dealing with uh, UI strings. And it's the same for us, it's the same for all of our clients. Uh, there are multiple ways, multiple ways you can represent that something is a UI string. You can go a good blend of italics, quotes, uh, different uh, uh, capitalization, uh, or for example, using the greater than mark as a UI element delimiter. All of these things, again, and I have a lot of examples from German here, all of these things can easily be pre-selected on the UI level, and the engine can also be smart enough to recognize by some of uh, linguistic content, uh, linguistic context, semantic context, it will understand that, yes, I'm dealing with a UI string here, and these are the conventions that the user selected that I need to apply here. So here, as you can see, we have a good group of uh, German, uh, German selections. So again, UI element translation is something that machine translation can take on and handle, helping uh, you with your international oh, effort. <laughs> okay, one day I'll pronounce it correctly. Uh, we spoke earlier about capitalization. The differences uh, for entities and capitalization rules are also pre-built in many MT engines, and you can regulate them through, in, uh, through regional settings. Uh, like here, for example, I chose a, this is, I believe, I don't remember which client it is. I think, I think I know which client it is, but that's one of their catalog entry descriptions where as you can see, everything is capitalized because that's what, what's required by English grammar. You can easily select uh, the regional setting and say, okay, whenever I'm dealing with a title and I'm semantically formatting wise, recognizing this line as a title, I only capitalize based on the standards of the target language, I capitalize the first letter of the entry word and I do not capitalize anything else. If we wanted to, if a language would be against, say, Slavic language, we could also tell the engine, and by the way, you also want to add double quotes here. You want to add quotes here to, uh, to produce that proper, uh, <coughs> properly non-capitalized UI string. Uh, now, the very basic thing, but it can also be, I mean, this is really a no-brainer, this is first-grade material, but still happens a lot of times uh, when the source text is represented in the local code page, an intelligent MT engine can easily recognize that this is the source code page, it's not Unicode, and uh, I need to convert it into the target code page. We're using CNN as an example here of UTF-8. If you see any Unicode, you will preserve it. If you see any ISO, any local code page, an MT engine can render the target text in the uh, in, in the proper locale specific encoding. It's not as frequent anymore because mostly we are now dealing with Unicode text, but it still happens and it's uh, much nicer towards the user when the end user is sitting is seeing the proper target language text in, instead of a bunch of garbage. Garbage characters. So, um, currency representation. As I was saying, uh, financial industry content is a challenge for human translators. When we started our project with PayPal, they were very skeptical like, hey, how are you going to go about this? We have this. Our content is all about currency. 
it's all about variables and it's all about the chaos specific conventions. It's not about English. And luckily for us, uh, MT is able to handle such things. Again, on a very basic interface level, you can preset your conversion selections. Like here, for example, you can see for German, as you know, in many European countries, the dollar sign or the currency sign comes after the numeric value. And that's, again, something a post editor does not need to think about because that's something that a machine translation engine can pick up for you and uh, use the selected, use the selected uh, placement convention, currency signs placement convention. So as you can see, all of these are PayPal examples. There are multiple ways you can represent currency. You can play with the delimiters. Here we have dot, here we have comma and you can play with the positioning of the currency sign, and you don't need to think about it. You think about it once, and then from there on, you're guaranteed that the engine is going to consistently be observing the local conventions that you had selected. Uh, now, this is my favorite example. When we initially came to speak to PayPal, they said, okay, here is our standard English sentence for you, and now show us how you're going to translate it. The standard English sentence from PayPal was variable 1, variable 2, A, variable 3. From his, her, even gender is ambiguous here. Variable 4, variable 5, to variable 6, variable 7, or variable 8. <laughs> Excellent. Anyone would find it. You're lucky it's not var, 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 bed, var, var, bed. <laughs> yeah, but that's... That already was better. It's a var, 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 yeah, but I, I wanted to say variable to make, you know, to make the drama even more, <laughs> even more explicit. So what do we have here? We have... John Smith paid 100 bucks from his German bank account to Jane Doe on January 1st, 2010. It's perfect, but unfortunately, this is what the translator sees, and this is what the machine translation engine sees. So uh, we've done quite a bit of work to uh, convert it, and besides all those variables, since you can't see what they are, how do you know whether it's his or her? How do you know the gender of, the, uh, of an adjective if all you see are those variables, so actually this is our, I mean, we're very proud, we feel extremely accomplished here, because we've learned, we've trained the engine to deal with that content, and by coding the um, variables on a dictionary level, we can actually observe the target language grammar with all the gender particularities, with all the conjugations and, conjugations and declensions. So you get, in the last sentence, you get your proper uh, German bank card translation with a proper grammar on French. So again, handling variables and assigning the right grammatical morphological attributes to variables is also something machine translation engine can do for you and take care in your take care for you in in, uh, in the translation effort. So um, now this one is just quickly uh, how do we train our engine? The standard. Now, something we don't have here, we have just started doing, is also import dictionaries from Acrolinks. Whenever it's available, import dictionaries and rules from Acrolinks is another arrow that's missing from this slide. That's something that we need to add. So basically, you uh, use TMs to build language model and bilingual model. You use glossaries to build dictionaries, or as I said, you use Acrolinks dictionaries where they are available. You create your own dictionaries, use statistical harvester for term extraction, and then do a couple of substantial alignment uh, alignment tricks to create uh, phrase tables and multi-word expressions. So as a result of that, you get the deep hybrid. Now what I wanted to talk about is how the deep hybrid engine can, uh, and I, I believe it still ties into the internationalization domain because it's still about uh, displaying, uh, locale, making locale-specific choices on the global content. Like here, for example, using a PayPal example, uh, here is the uh, environment of PayPal, uh, translation server, idiom world server, and the connector. Uh, we deployed something called virtual style guide that's making grammar choices on the client's behalf, and then dictionary editor, that's, that's the only place where the system is allowed to make a forced lexical choice. The rest of the time, it's going to go to the corpus and try to see if the corpus has a better lexical choice for you. But here, invoke the command display. Again, commands is any internationalization engineer's nightmare usually because of the way they, be, they are displayed, because of the way they behave in context. Some of them you translate, some of them you do not translate, some of them stay in nominative, some of them you need to change, and so forth. 
So here, just by making a forced choice, forced grammatical choice, invoke the command display will be translated, can be translated multiple different ways. You can translate, not translate, or display both the source and the translation. And this is where you can explicitly import the company's style guide, the company's either global or locale specific style guide, and make the engine make the choice that suits the client best. Um, same. Uh, another thing that we did, and uh, uh, that ties back into what uh, David was talking about earlier in his favorite English presentation. Sometimes English, U.S. English, is not going to work in the U.K. So what can also be done, you can look, write conversion algorithms that would convert U.S. English into U.K. English. And here is an example of how that, that's something, and I know in my client life uh, when I was working for Autodesk, I remember that we were paying a ton of money to U.K. Post editors because uh, they're just expensive by, because of their geographical location, and they charge you a lot of money for translating from English into English. And that's something machine translation can actually take on and has been successfully taking on, and I've seen outside of our Pro MC deployment, I've seen a couple of other similar deployments. Basically, by utilizing substitution tables, you can easily create US to UK, UK to US, UK to Australian English, Indian English, Singlish, or whatever. You can create those conversion modules and save a lot of effort and a ton of money. And this is something I'm showing here, which has been produced by the machine. A human has not touched it. Check that your check was sent in the US mail. As you can see, the system would be intelligent enough to know that check as a verb does not change the spelling. However, check as a noun changes the spelling. So, and we play the same game with French, Canadian, Latin American, Spanish, and so forth. It's really fun, and uh, it, it saves the clients a lot of money. So, so that's something that's referred to as a normalization suite. Conversion between same same languages, different locales. Let me ask you, if, if you're smart enough to know that, that check, check once and check once, uh -huh. the second time, why wouldn't the engine have the weakness in that case, which is the English UK sentence, uh, know if it's US post or actually UK? You know what, we, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, we just never thought, that's the first time it comes up, it should have. We that's never, true. in the substitution, because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all uh, mapping tables based, uh -huh. so we never, we never thought about it. This never came up as a requirement. Then it's uh, more like it could, it, it could be U.S. Post. It could be. In both. Maybe, it's, it could maybe, be. It's, maybe it's targeting, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's the U.K. Mm -hmm. population living in the U.S. That's and and why, would it, <laughs> why, why would a big bad you say that your check was sent in the mail? So you don't need to say U.S. mail. I know, but this is, see, this is the point. <laughs> I take your point taken, Where's and David? actually I want, I want to go home and uh, ask people, well, maybe I'll ask Yuki after this session. <laughs> She's going to tell me what to do. What to so do. actually, uh, we switch sometimes, you know, uh, we often say U.S. postal mail, and uh, we switch to, you know, uh, Italian, Japanese, even in English. Now I'm also tempted to add a royal somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> royal I think the royal post, royal post, the US mail, royal post. Post is actually replaced, I, I, but I take you to UK point. Um, okay, here is another example, and basically uh, with our engine, different engines approach it differently. But I know, again, from my software development uh, background, I know that all those Mexican variants of translation, French variants of translation, they're kind of hard to account for <coughs> to engage a human. So it is very nice that now with the, with the current state of MT engines, you can switch, simply switch your preferences and say, from here on, my French is Canadian French variant. And now let that switch me to Swiss French and so forth. So and here is just an example of an interface that lets you, and basically that's going to make all the other choices in terms of variables, in terms of time and timestamps and uh, UI string handling. All those al algorithms are saved for a particular uh, locale specific, ge geo specific profile. Uh, and some other nice things like uh, client style guide can also be addressed by the machine translation engine. For example, as you can see here, my Spanish is rusty, so I'm not going to read it. But uh, Dell's preference was not to use a personal pronoun as a subject. So that's something, again, you can make it as a forced choice on the interface level, uh, deploying the, employing the virtual style guide technology, and you'll never see the personal pronoun uh, as, as a subject again. Uh, one other
another thing that's very important, uh, it, it has to do again with handling variables and handling metadata. If your MT engine can handle metadata, it also saves you a lot of post-editing time and saves you a lot of, uh, basically the headache, globalization headache, how do I make my uh, tags, how do I make my meta metadata applicable in all local contexts? That can be very simply addressed by uh, employing uh, markup and metadata uh, alg based algorithms in your machine translation engine. As you can see here in the example below, you can see that all the placeholders, and here we are dealing with EDM World Server placeholders, the engine would have the, have the intelligence to arrange placeholders in accordance with the target language grammar so that when you spit the content, content out of EDM back into the production environment, whatever those tags were standing for, whether it was a formatting, whether it was any kind of attribute, they will be moving around the sentence in accordance with the target sentence grammar. And the target words will have the formatting, the metadata attributes, whatnot, whatever, the, whatever it's supposed to be. And again, from um, I was when I was working at Autodesk, we were once one of the earliest Indian World Server adopters, and I remember what a big pain it was for our engineers to figure out what to do with those bottom tests. So it's very refreshing to see that uh, that uh, there there seems to be a solution. Do not translate choices. Here, just a quick example. The command, as I was telling you, commands can be really tricky. Like here, for example, you can see issue the show commands. Uh, Pablo is not here because that's actually, that's Pablo's content. Issue the show command. We need to show it, show commands how to write memory. Issue the command, write memory. As you can see, you have a good blend of translate me, do not translate me, do not touch me scenarios here. All of them can be pre-coded. They're context-based rules that you can pre-code on the MT engine level. And when I say rules, I'm not talking about rule-based system, I'm talking about parsing rules. They have nothing to do with what translation algorithms are going to be employed here. Uh, as you can see, the engine can do what you want it to do. It can translate some commands based on the context and some commands or some other ways of using the word show will remain untranslated. So do not translate context in our world, in TroMC world, is a group that consists of a command keyword and do not translate context. So if all of those terms are in place, you know that you do not translate the content of this particular command. Um, just a couple of words, and uh, since we just had an accolades presentation, I don't want to be too repetitive, but because many of those things were already covered. This is what can cause issues, and I believe it's also a part of internationalization effort. Incorrect spelling, improper punctuation, improper use of diacritics, incomplete sentences, omitted syntactic words, unconventional abbreviations. All of these things are linguistically challenging for MT Engine. So working with a pre-editing tool is highly recommended. We actually not so long ago did a shared uh, webinar with uh, Accolades talking exactly about this. Uh, machine translation is very much impacted by what your source looks like. If those things are removed, if your content is really prepared for, much, for any kind of translation, machine translation included, at the end of the day you save a lot more on the post editing. Incorrect translation, as you can see, poor source can give you a lot of headache. Uh, you will not recognize an abbreviation. You will not recognize a sentence starter. You will not recognize a question as a question simply because uh, you don't have a question mark at the end. So here are some examples, and the presentation will be available later, so you can look closer at the examples. Here are some examples of how bad the translation can be if just a minor little thing is not done properly on the source. So please pre-edit your source as much as you can. It's just, it's just needed. Um, here is the perfect workflow, ideal workflow, uh, where we maintain everything we maintain, and I'm using Apple IQ and I'm using Prime C, but the rule is rather, whatever you are doing with content authoring, please make sure that your MC provider is made aware of it, because if these two play together, you are the winning one at the end. So this is what we are using a couple of our clients, and it, uh, as per David's previous presentation, it works really well. Um, and you can import terms between the systems, and you can also swap rules, import rules between the systems as well. Uh, prepare for 
machine translation, just like you would for any other internationalization project, fix your source, clean up your TMs and glossaries, train the MT engine, and indicate explicit choices for metadata handling, which is going to take care of your command translation, variables, uh, time and date conversions, and so forth. So uh, this is just a sample idiom uh, workflow with an idiom world server, where, as you can see, the machine translation is uh, machine translation is applied after segmentation and repetitions have been cal calculated. And if you apply machine translation at that stage, and your content has been prepared, uh, basically your post editor's task uh, is uh, is much lighter than it would have been if all the previous steps were omitted. So uh, that's about it. Uh, questions. No questions, no, no I don't have a question. Sure, okay, sure, sure. So, um, you know, of course, people can pseudo translate, but this seems to uh, uh, go one step further. Where, where, where would this particularly be worthwhile versus uh, pseudo translation? Well, when people pseudo translate, uh, Simone and I just had this conversation uh, at lunch. When people usually machine translation was used for pseudo translation. Right. Uh, just to feel the purpose, the goal of pseudo translation is just to feel the strings, right? When you right. pseudo translate, you usually think about the string length. Well, but right? also character and code. Characters, characters, yeah, yeah. Right, okay. the characters, what else? Yeah, double characters, string length. Uh, this, I would say, it's useful in a lot more. It's uh, When we were thinking how to tie it into internationalization, we were thinking a lot of things that people now do manually as a part of their internationalization effort, okay. now can just be completely outsourced to the MT engine to handle. Uh -huh. Like you don't need to think about your time and date and that convention. Uh -huh. You don't need to think about currency conversion conventions. You don't need to think about variable handling, how the variable is going to behave in various international contexts. You can, machine translation engine can take care of all of those tasks for you. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you can do it, of course, before the project. Uh -huh. If you want to see, so basically, if you want, not only are you going to see the characters, not only are you going to see the string length, but you're also going to see, okay, this is how my variables are going to behave. Okay. This is how metadata is going to migrate in the string together with the, together with the words, with the mm -hmm. actual content that the metadata uh, is applied to. Right. So in, it, I would say it's equally important for project preparation, what you're preparing for your project, and at project execution. Because okay. right? you can test how much MT can actually take on. Okay. Does it, does it make sense? From, from the MT perspective, it makes sense. From the developer perspective, I'm not sure, because often the developer who maybe is testing or uh, unit testing or whatever they may be doing, uh, they may not understand the target language at all, so it's useful for them to use pseudo-localization because they can see the English mm -hmm. string within the message. Right. So that, that's useful for them to know. They add a bunch of characters, but they can still actually know what it says right. and see, see, see if it goes. But this is, this is, I don't know, I was thinking really uh, from a site perspective, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 you know, like what you had, CNN.com, this is like for a really active, dynamic site, kind of a fascinating uh, uh, application. So, mm -hmm. You know, I see room for both. In the real world case, though, I have to say some of our developers do prefer to have MT That's globalization great. builds. Uh -huh. It's a good combination. In uh -huh. some cases, as you say, it is helpful to have the English English string surrounded by prefixes and suffixes. Uh -huh. But in some of the cases, actually, our developers want the fully localized build. All right. So to have it at no cost, we just feed it. It's fully automated. So either pseudo translated or MT translated right. for us, it's the same. Right. We feed it into the engine and uh, they get it. Yeah. So it's a good alternative. It's not necessarily the only solution, but uh -huh. we do use it in production. Actually. And I would also say when you do the MT only build, it also expands if you're also uh, applying all those uh, options like conven conventions, conversions, and whatnot. Sure. It expands right. the range of test cases that can be run, can uh -huh. be performed on that MT build. Uh -huh. You're not only testing the, the obvious basic things. But you can also test uh, much more complex stuff than I was talking that I was right. talking about right. here. Sure. So I do I do believe it's pretty useful. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay.
So if no more questions, I guess I'm done. Just a quick question on the date time. You say that you translate the date time, but you don't, do you uh, pay attention to the time zones? Or is it just 9 p.m. is 21, <coughs> 2100? As opposed to 9 p.m. is in that time zone, maybe right. 5 a.m. You know what, we've never been in a situation where we have to do that. If you are doing, I'm trying to think of a life scenario, real life scenario, where I would have to translate thinking about the time zone. What would that be, well, for example? Because usually, we are, say we are translating a website, and there is time on this website. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's going to be live into the, uh, oh, that's a good question, actually. If I'm translating and I'm saying, and right now it is such and such time somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, we've never had a test like a case like this. Since we don't have a clock built into the system, I don't think we'll be able to. I mean, it's the same problem with, you know, when you have the U.S. post versus U.K. post. So when you can say, we made a deposit of, you know, two small mm -hmm. deposits less than one dollar. If you tell me this and I'm a user in Frank, yeah. I say, please don't. I'm going to pay 20 euros of fees to the bank so you deposit one dollar. Deposit one euro. Mm -hmm. So if you don't change the currency, right. but as I said, I mean, how much are you localized when you do your, your NT translation, yeah. right. what are the rules that you're going to apply to, hey, do I keep something that's local to the US market, or do I put something that's more local to the, to the French market? Is it a French time? Is it a French currency? Yeah. But, I would, I would but it's, say, you make it more and more complex. I, would, I agree, but I would say it's up to the application owner to tell us what to do. Totally. Right? Machine translation is like a cab. If you take the driver where to take it, it will take you there. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just going to spin around in circles. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, totally the, this is where you want to be. You know, we want also to plug in the time. That's limit. something that you need to handle programmatically. You know, yeah. Okay, this, it, this time is yeah. you know, the local time for the year. Right. The restaurant will open at 5 p.m. Right, and send me euros. Don't send me the yeah. dollars. Yes, yeah. but if they are told, of course, there is anything you can, uh, you can address you can programmatically. Yeah. Most certainly. Thank you. Okay. And thank you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you.